Hi everyone, this lesson is on serotonin syndrome. So we're going to talk about what causes this condition. We're also going to talk about the pathophysiology behind why it occurs. We'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So serotonin syndrome is also known as serotonin toxicity. It is a potentially life-threatening condition involving excessive serotonergic activation with associated symptoms. We're going to talk about the symptoms later on in this lesson. And this condition may occur in patients who take medications that activate the serotonergic system. We're going to talk about many of those medications in the next slide. So again, it is caused by overactivation of the serotonergic system. Now, serotonin syndrome is considered a rare condition, although the true prevalence is unknown. It's likely that it probably occurs more often than reported, but it occurs as milder cases. It occurs in all age groups. And there is an increasing prevalence of this condition with the increasing use of serotonergic antidepressants. Now let's talk about the medications that can cause this condition. Some of the main causes of this condition are going to be serotonergic antidepressants. So these are going to include the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRI antidepressants, tricyclic antidepressants or TCA antidepressants, monoamine oxidase inhibitors or MAOIs, which actually carry some of the highest risk of causing serotonin syndrome, but these antidepressants are not used nowadays. And then 5-HTP can also cause serotonin syndrome. Now, a lot of times patients are going to be on these medications on a stable dose. If they take too much of one of these serotonergic antidepressants, they can cause serotonin syndrome. But a lot of times it's going to be that they're on a stable dose of these serotonergic antidepressants, and then they either combine the use of these types of medications, so maybe they take an SSRI and then they take a TCA antidepressant for another use, or they use another medication or supplement. So if you're already on a stable dose of one of these serotonergic antidepressants, and then you use one of these following medications and supplements, you're at an increased risk for having serotonin syndrome. Some of these include the natural supplement known as St. John's Wort, which is actually used to treat symptoms of depression. Using migraine abortive medications like sumatriptan, rizotriptan, and zomotriptan, if you use one of these medications and you're already on a dose of one of these serotonergic medications we talked about before, that increases your risk for serotonin syndrome. If selegiline, which is a Parkinson's disease medication, is added on when a patient already is on one of these other medications, this can also increase the risk for serotonin syndrome. The use of antibiotics can also increase the risk of serotonin syndrome if you're already on a stable dose of one of these other medications. So the antibiotics that can do this include linezolid and ciprofloxacin. Opiate analgesics like mepiridine and tramadol can also increase the risk for serotonin syndrome. And then using some cough medications that contain dextromethorphan, which we can find in Robitussin, and this can also increase the risk of serotonin syndrome if you're already on one of these other medications we talked about before. And some antiepileptics like valproate and carbamazepine, along with some of these other medications, can also increase the risk for serotonin syndrome. Now let's briefly talk about the pathophysiology behind serotonin syndrome. It all begins with the amino acid tryptophan. The amino acid tryptophan is used to produce serotonin. It actually undergoes a couple of different enzymatic reactions. Now you don't have to remember all of this, but I do want to show this for completeness sake. Tryptophan undergoes enzymatic reaction by the enzyme tryptophan hydroxylase to form 5-hydroxytryptophan or 5-HTP. Remember that was one of the serotonergic medications that can lead to or increase the risk of serotonin syndrome, especially if it's used in combination with other medications that also increase the levels of serotonin. So 5-HTP is produced from tryptophan by tryptophan hydroxylase enzyme. This is actually the rate limiting step. 5-hydroxytryptophan is then converted by the enzyme L-aromatic amino acid decarboxylase into 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is serotonin. So 5-HT is serotonin. Now, when serotonin has been produced, it can act on a variety of different receptors in the brain to modulate mood, appetite, sleep, and attention but it also has other regulatory functions in the body. Serotonin receptors are present within the gastrointestinal system, so present in the intestines. So serotonin does regulate gastrointestinal or GI motility. Serotonin is also involved in thermal regulation, and it's involved in platelet function. And then when serotonin has completed its function, it is metabolized in the liver by the enzyme monoamine oxidase. So you can see here already that some of these help us to better understand why certain medications can lead to serotonin syndrome. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors, for instance, inhibit this enzyme, inhibits the breakdown of serotonin, so this can 
lead to increased levels of serotonin. Taking 5-HTP can lead to increased serotonin levels, and the SSRIs increase serotonin within the synaptic cleft, and some of those other medications we talked about before also increase the levels of serotonin. So all of these can increase serotonin levels, leading to a variety of issues which can be related to hyperactivation of some of these functions. So now let's talk about what happens when serotonin syndrome occurs. It's important to make note of the fact that serotonin syndrome occurs rapidly. There's a rapid onset of symptoms after a serotonergic medication has been either increased too high or an additional serotonergic activating medication is added. So there is a rapid onset of symptoms in most cases. So oftentimes, 30% of patients will develop symptoms within one hour. 60% of patients will develop symptoms within six hours. And then almost all patients will develop some symptoms within 24 hours. So after the addition of a new serotonergic activating medication, almost all patients will develop some symptoms within 24 hours of the addition of that medication. So what are some of those symptoms? A lot have to do with what we call the serotonin syndrome triad. There are three main categories of symptoms that occur with serotonin syndrome. One of them is mental status changes. Another one is autonomic hyperactivity. And another one is neuromuscular abnormalities. And this can be remembered by the mnemonic MAN, M-A-N. So M for mental status changes, A for autonomic hyperactivity, and N for neuromuscular abnormalities. Now, with regards to mental status changes, this can range anywhere from some lethargy, a little bit of anxiety, to confusion and disorientation. With regards to autonomic hyperactivity, the autonomic nervous system becomes hyperactive, as its name suggests. So we can see fever and chills, hyperthermia, tachycardia and some other arrhythmias, hypertension, so an elevated blood pressure, flushing, sweating, and dilated pupils. And then with regards to neuromuscular abnormalities, we can see restlessness occurring, tremors, agitation, myoclonus, which can be ocular clonus or an inducible clonus. If you want more information on clonus, please look up some clinical exam videos to see what this looks like. Hyperreflexia can also be noted. Some rigidity may also be noted. And then a positive Babinski sign can also be noted bilaterally. So some of these are important findings with regards to serotonin syndrome. So again, serotonin syndrome triad involves mental status changes, autonomic hyperactivity, and neuromuscular abnormalities. And the one I want you to take away here is myoclonus, which can be an ocular clonus or an inducible clonus. Now there's some other signs and symptoms and complications that can occur from serotonin syndrome. These are going to affect the gastrointestinal system. We talked about serotonin actually regulating gastrointestinal motility. So if there's too much serotonin, this can actually lead to gastrointestinal issues. Some of these include diarrhea. So you can imagine that more and more serotonin increases gastrointestinal motility, so we get more diarrhea. This is actually going to be a key finding with regards to serotonin syndrome. We can also see nausea and vomiting occurring as well. And then we can see increased bowel sounds. And then there also can be some abdominal pain. So again, gastrointestinal symptoms are very important to recognize in serotonin syndrome. And then there are some other complications that can occur. These include rhabdomyolysis. So due to those neuromuscular abnormalities, rhabdomyolysis can occur. This is a breakdown of muscle. And because of this rhabdomyolysis, this breakdown of muscle, the muscles release myoglobin. And then myoglobin can actually cause damage to the kidneys. It can lead to renal failure. And then some other complications of serotonin syndrome include shock as well. And here is an image reviewing some of the more important findings in serotonin syndrome. So diaphoresis, which is sweating, midriasis, which is dilated pupils, tachycardia, agitation, autonomic instability, which we can see with hypertension, increased bowel sounds, which can also occur with diarrhea, hyperreflexia, and clonus. And I also want to mention that the neuromuscular abnormalities are more often found in the lower extremities. So the hyperreflexia and the clonus are more often found in the lower extremities. How do clinicians diagnose and treat serotonin syndrome? There are several different diagnostic criteria that clinicians use to make the diagnosis of serotonin syndrome. One of them is Hunter criteria, and Hunter criteria is one that is more often used. There are two criteria that have to be met to make the diagnosis of serotonin syndrome. One is that there is a history of use or exposure to a serotonergic medication. And two, one or more of the following have to be present. Either there's a spontaneous onset of clonus. Two, there is inducible clonus with agitation and diaphoresis, which is sweating. Three, there's ocular clonus with agitation and diaphoresis. Four, there's a tremor and hyperreflexia. Five, there's hypertonia. 
In six, there's a fever, which is a temperature over 30 degrees Celsius with ocular or inducible clonus. So this is one way of making the diagnosis of serotonin syndrome. The problem with this is that oftentimes this is only going to pick up more severe cases of serotonin syndrome. There may be milder cases of serotonin syndrome that are not detected. Once a clinician has diagnosed serotonin syndrome, how is it treated? It's important to avoid overactivation of the serotonergic system. So if a patient is already on a serotonergic medication, like one of those antidepressants we talked about before, it's important to avoid using some of those other medications and supplements we talked about before, including some of those antibiotics like ciprofloxacin. If they do have serotonin syndrome, it's important to discontinue the use of the causative medications. And with this, oftentimes patients will have self-resolution of the condition. However, it's important to provide supportive treatment for these patients. So hydration is very important. Anti-fever medication is also important. And blood pressure management may also be important as well, as this condition may increase the blood pressure of the patient. Benzodiazepines can also be used if sedation is required for these patients. And then there may be some use with ciproheptidine. Now, this may help reverse some of the symptoms of serotonin syndrome, but some evidence is lacking with regards to this medication. If you want to learn more about other conditions like neuroleptic malignant syndrome, please check out my lesson on that topic. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.